If you find that you're having to copy and paste code from one script into another, but just slightly tweak a few functions, then this tutorial can help you because you don't need to be doing that if you're making good use of inheritance and interfaces. And this can all seem really confusing when you first look at it, but I have two examples lined up for things that you might actually want to use in your game. One is interactables like doors and switches, and the second is enemies that have a lot of common things like loot drops and health, but they still have room for unique behavior like attacks and movement. I'm really excited about this one because this is an awesome topic. Ready? Let's go. So here's our scene. We have an NPC, a door, and a lever. There's really nothing fancy going on. The NPC has a collider and a rigid body, and the door and lever are literally just sprites right now. And if you look at my controls using Unity's input system, I have an interact button, just the E key set up here. And so what we want to do is if we're close enough to any of these objects and we press the interact button, we want to interact with them. The NPC we'd want to talk to, the door we would want to open, and the lever we would pull and trigger some sort of event. So let's set up a new script called interactable base and open it up. So as the name suggests, this will be the base class for the NPC, the door and the lever. So all the common stuff that all of them will share, we'll set up here in the base. So let's create an on trigger enter 2D and an on trigger exit 2D function. And first we're gonna check if a trigger is colliding with the player. So let's find the player, set up a protected game object and protected means it's private to outside classes, but it'll still be accessible to classes that inherit from this base class. So let's find the player in the awake function. My player has a player class on him, but you could search by tag just as easily like this. So now let's add our check for the player collision into our functions. Now let's set up a bool that we can switch called is interactable, and it'll be true when the player enters the trigger and false when the player exits the trigger. Now in update, we can say if is interactable is true and we hit the interact button, then we want to interact. Now here's the important part. Any script that inherits this one, which I'll show you how to do soon, must have an interact function. We do not want a choice. We need to have something happen when we press the interact button or it's not interactable, right? So what we'll do is make a public abstract void called interact. Abstract means it must be implemented. It'll make you, which again, you'll see soon. So abstract methods actually have no implementation. The logic gets implemented in the child class. So that way we can keep it unique for each object that inherits from this base class. I promise you this will all make sense in just a few moments. And if you have an abstract function, you have to make your class abstract as well. So, okay, we will call the interact function here. Now let's actually create a class that inherits from this one. Create a class called NPC interaction, and let's open it up. Now, right away, let's make this inherit from interactable base. And you'll see we get an error. It's telling us we're not implementing the abstract method that we created. So again, we have to have an interact method in here since we made it abstract. That's what I meant when I said it will force you. So we can right click, quick actions and refactoring, and implement the abstract class. And notice that this is an override method. We're basically implementing a blank method here in the base class, but here we're overriding that and passing in actual logic. So here's where we could do our NPC interaction stuff, like start dialogue, et cetera, et cetera. I've done a tutorial on a dialogue system before if you wanna check that out, but to keep this tutorial simple, I'll just throw in a debug.log. So interesting thing to note is that even if you try to drag this base class onto a game object, it won't let you. Abstract classes are not meant to sit on game objects. They are built to have child classes that are attached instead. So let's attach this script to our NPC. Now our NPC already has a collider here. The on trigger enter script has to be attached to a game object that has the trigger collider on it. But no problem, we'll just get rid of this and create a child called interaction, create a circle trigger area as big as we want, and attach the NPC interaction script now. Let's test really quick. We get nice and close, press the interact button, and we get our log message. One quick change though, it would be great to know when these guys are in fact interactable. So back in our interactable base class, let's add an interactable indicator icon. Set it to inactive at the start of the game and active when we enter the trigger area and inactive again when we exit the trigger area. So let's create that object really quick. I'm gonna bring in a triangle 
and point it down. And a static triangle is really boring. So I'll create a script called icon hover, which makes it hover up and down based on a sine wave. You can pause if you want to copy this, but I'm going to move on because this is really not very important to the topic of this video. It really just makes things look nicer. I'll turn this into a prefab and attach it as a child of the interaction object and place it up a little bit and drag it into our slot here. Let's test again. All right, cool. Now it's really easy to tell when it's interactable and when it's not. So we have our NPC working. How do we get our door and lever working the exact same way? Well, create a script called door interaction and make it inherit from interactable base. We have to implement the method here too, and we'll log a message for the door. Before we attach it actually, all our interactables need a trigger to work. So back in the interactable base, Let's just make that required up here. And we want it to be a trigger. So here's a really cool trick. Add a reset function, which gets called when a component is added to a game object, as well as when we hit the reset button here. And let's make sure it's a trigger. And if we want a specific size, we can tell it that here as well. And now let's add the door interaction, which will add a circle collider as a trigger at the radius that we already want. Add our interaction icon as a child and plug that in here. And one more time for our lever, I'll make a script called lever interaction, make it inherit from interactable base and implement the interact method. Attach that and drag in our icon and plug that in there. And let's test. So NPC log is called, door log is called, and lever log is called, right? So the base class handles all your common functions that you want everything to have, and the child classes handles all the unique logic that you want to run. I hope that makes sense. So now let's get rid of these guys and bring in our enemies because I really want to show you another example that's going to work a little bit differently to help hammer this point of inheritance and interfaces home for you. So right now, all three of them have colliders, rigid bodies, and animators, but that is it. So in my example here, what I want is for these enemies to have health so that I can damage them. I want them to drop loot when they die while all having their own unique movement behaviors. So we're gonna start by creating an enemy base class. And before we open that, I wanna create another script called idamageable and open that one first. What we're doing right now is making an interface. So let's include all the variables that we'll need for health, as well as all the functions that we'll need for receiving damage. You don't need to say whether these are public or private, they're always public in an interface. And because this is an interface, there's not going to be a function implementation here either. So let's open our enemy base class now and add our idamageable interface after the mono behavior. So kind of like an abstract method, if you attach an interface, it'll force you to implement all those variables and all those methods. So let's right click, quick actions and refactoring and implement the interface. Let's get rid of all this junk here. Okay, so I do want this here to show up in the inspector and right now it won't. So let's add a field, serialized field attribute here, give it a default, and now this will actually show up in the inspector. And now let's just write some really simple logic for the damage and die functions. Very, very simple stuff. Now, one of the highlights of using an interface is obviously we need to call this method from somewhere. And you can see in my player attack script here, there's a lot going on, but really the only thing I want you to notice is here, we're grabbing the component and here we're calling the damage function. So this isn't even just limited to enemies. Any script in your game that has an eye damageable interface attached to it, crates, barrels, enemies, trees, breakable walls, whatever. If they have an eye damageable attached, this will damage them. That's one of the reasons that I like using interfaces so much. Now, honestly, we can test this out right now. I'll make a script called blue ghost and attach it to this guy. And we'll make it inherit from enemy base. And literally without doing anything else, you can see that if we play and we hit him, he'll die. So this is already working. But we also wanted to add a loot drop. 
and some unique enemy behavior as well. So for the loot, let's create another interface called iLootable. And let's actually make it an interface and we'll create one method and an array of game objects that it'll choose to spawn from, as well as a rigid body so we can make the loot go flying when it spawns in and a force amount for that. So back in enemy base, let's add iLootable and implement that and delete all this stuff and make this serialized so we can see it in the inspector and default it to five. So big difference between inheritance and interfaces. You can only inherit from one class, but you can add as many interfaces as you want. Inheritance can have functions with actual logic and interfaces cannot, okay? So for our spawn loot, let's pick a random number and instantiate our loot. And while we're at it, let's grab the rigid body component at the same time and assign it to our loot RB variable. And we'll call spawn loot when we die. Now, an important thing I wanted to show you, for the interactables, we used an abstract class and you do not have to use an abstract class or an abstract method to use inheritance. And so I did wanna show you another option that you do have with inheritance, which is virtual methods. So let's make this method virtual here. So what that means is we can now go to our blue ghost script here and add an override method, just like we did with the abstract method from before, except this time it'll give us a base.spawn loot here. So the override keyword means that this function will literally override the one from the base class, but we can still call the one from the base class like this. If we don't do this, then the one from the base class will not get called. And now if we want, we can add our own unique logic in here. Let's make the loot fly up when the enemy dies. Now to test, I just have these three coins here. They just have a rigid body and a collider on there, nothing else. This is just for testing. So let's assign those here. And let's actually test. So we come over here, we kill the enemy and yep, the loot flies up, awesome. So let's do the next guy. So let's create a green ghost script and attach it to the green one and a king ghost script and attach it to this guy. So the green ghost will inherit from enemy base. Now, notice that we don't have any errors. With abstract methods, like what we use with the interactables, you have to implement an abstract function. But with virtual methods, it's completely optional. You do not have to. So we have to remember to add the override here. And let's say for this one, we'll make it fly to the right. And now the king ghost. Implement from enemy base, add the override method, and we'll make this one fly to the left. Attach the loot to those two enemies and let's test again. Okay, so we kill the green guy and it flies to the right. We kill the king and it flies to the left and we kill the blue guy and it flies straight up. Awesome. And obviously each of these classes here can have unique enemy behaviors and attacks. You can see I added some simple sine wave functionality to each of them, but changed it up for each of them here. And to show you the blue ghost as an example, you can see that all of that was implemented in the update function here in the child class with just a few new variables up here. Now, the last thing to note with this is that notice here, I have the override keyword on my start method and I've made it public. That's because I actually have a start method on my enemy base here as well, which I made virtual. If you don't do this and you just have two start methods, the one on your base class won't get called, which can be really, really confusing if you're trying to debug stuff. So you make the base class start method virtual and override it in the child class and call base.start at the beginning to ensure that they both get called. You can do the same on the update method as well if you need to. I tried to keep this tutorial as clean and as simple as possible, and I really hope that this helped you guys understand inheritance and interfaces and when you might want to use them just a little bit better. That's all I got, guys. If you want access to the source code on this project, my patrons get access to all my tutorial source code, so head over there if that sounds like something that interests you. Like the video if you liked. I hope you enjoyed, and see you in the next one.
I want to give a very special thank you to all of our Hall of Fame patrons, Jakob Yonduck, Throbbing Wind, Christopher Nichols, Zondra Kessler, Fontaine Waite, Brainwaves to Binary, Couch, and Dan Brooking, as well as our Early Access patrons. Ken Waite, Mason Crow, Mr. D, Outer Games, Yon, Liquid Egg, Alexander Prestis, Godsworn, Abilaziz, Hamad, Alanazi, Ober, Bill Guo, Alone on Mars, Kojutsu, Ayush Sharma, Alex Friedman, Barry McCauley, Felipe Gomez Dos Santos, Mario Android Dev, Rui Souza, and Varagon Studios. If you choose to support us on Patreon, you can get early access to all of our YouTube videos, monthly alpha builds, and more.